I need to practice it more. <laughs> so I, that was a threat. <laughs> and I became very used to, Matt, <coughs> please help. Um, so with, with all of that, I realized to learn enough to be of help to students, we really need to have more of a master plan. And it boils down to when you've got a, a college of tenured professors who therefore basically are independent contractors, and you now are asking them for the good of the students, you need to come together and have a common theme and a common goal, and we need to decide the outcomes that we want students to have. And then maybe let's divide up those outcomes. You teach that one, you teach that one, you teach that one. It's still possible for students to graduate having achieved and learned a whole range of skills, but they won't get that range from any one individual professor. However, unless each of us, I think, takes it upon ourselves to learn something new, I think the question we have to ask ourselves, where is the point at which we're no longer giving a minimally viable education? Where is the point at which we are being unethical by telling the world these people with a degree from this school are prepared for the future? If we're still preparing them for jobs that don't exist, are we acting ethically? I mean, the point is we've got to face that point. As parents get ticked off more and more at the cost of education, more and more people will be looking at, can we afford an education that is not preparing the kids for the, for the future? So all of that came together in uh, the thinking of, of getting people who have uh, technological skills and teaching skills and ha are doing both and can help us, I, I think, figure out how to think about some of these questions. So with that, Matt, wait. So we got tech skills and teaching skills together? So you're the one with the teaching skills. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> I suppose I should begin with an apology. I'm sorry I didn't know you were in that bad of a class. <laughs> Um, so, I've got probably hours to talk about on this, and if you want to meet me at the hotel bar later, um, we, can, we can talk a lot more, but um, I do actually, should actually start with an apology for that class, because I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you why that class went wrong, and, I, and I've pretty well nailed it down. And it's a problem that I think a lot of us face. Um, particularly at a conference like this, um, and to really bring this whole thing home, I got to talk about Facebook for a second. Facebook, I believe, is the devil, <laughs> and it's the devil for a reason you may not be thinking. The reason that Facebook is the devil is because it, uh, it leads you to this kind of frequentist fallacy that you see people on vacation and having a good time. You see people doing things. You see people going out to dinner, uh, having fun, going to concerts and all like that. And you look at your own life and you're like, man, I'm <laughs> boring. I don't ever go on vacation. I don't ever do anything fun. Well, that's not true. And you're no, you're no more or less boring than you were before you started paying attention to Facebook. Um, and it's just that you're not paying attention that this individual has gone on vacation for the first time in three years, and it's that person. It's the sum total of things. And to get even way more off track, it's actually Facebook's algorithm that's screwing with you. Another topic for another day. But that frequentist fallacy, that seeing things over and over and over again and believing that you must do them now to keep up, uh, creates real problems and real angst in our, in our, in our minds and our souls and, and, and wherever you want to believe it comes from. Um, you go to a thing like this. You go to a conference like NICAR or ONA or uh, any one of these uh, uh, conferences and you see brilliant people like Brian here talk and you're like, holy crap, I've got to learn that right now. That's amazing. I've got to be able to do that. My students would totally freak. Got to be able to do that. You walk out of there, 
You go to another session and you hear somebody equally brilliant, or you hear Jeremy, one or the other. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And you're like, oh my god, I didn't even know that existed. That's awesome. I've got to learn that right now. And you leave this place with a notebook or a, or a note on your phone or a file on your laptop that's pages deep of all the things you've got to learn in the next, what, week, two weeks? I mean, you've got to get going on this stuff, man. Let's do this. And you immediately have fallen into this Facebook-like frequentist trap where you're like, I can't possibly. And you know what? You can't. You can't. No one can. Not even Jeremy, who has this freak. Brian can tell you all about this. This is freakish ability to pull up the documentation for something and pretty much learn it in an afternoon. I hate you, by the way. Just want you to know. <laughs> I, I love you, Jeremy. <laughs> you employ it. You're happy. <laughs> so um, you can't. And keeping pace with change, I believe, starts with that admission. It is absolutely impossible to keep pace with change as we in this journalism world have defined it, which is everything. Everything is changing, so we must keep pace with it. You can't. You can't. It is impossible. Impossible. So you have to do the thing that Gary did. He did the right thing in trying to choose something. Where he went wrong, and where my class went wrong, is that he chose something that was step five or six, mm -hmm. skipping steps one through five to get there. The data visualization class that I taught, um, I generally, when I, when I teach a new class, uh, and that data viz class was the first time I taught it, it was a special topics class. I had set out a, a, a schedule and a syllabus, and, and we had materials, and I had a pretty good idea of where I wanted to start, which in the College of Journalism at the Harvard of the Plains, I believe, is about zero. When I get students in, I expect them not to be able to spell HTML. Um, <laughs> thanks, curriculum committee. Um, so I expect to start at zero, and I usually set some wildly impossible goal by the end of it with the notion that we're going to die somewhere along the way, and the further, the, the closer that goal we get to, the better the class will be. And so the problem I realized right away was that since we're starting with zero, and we're starting with z at zero with a class about data visualization on the web, I had a bunch of students in there who had never really looked at data before. Like, they had contemplated it in a reporting class, but most of them had never used a spreadsheet for journalism before. Okay, well, I'm going to have to cram a couple of classes on spreadsheets in here to like, you have to go find data and you have to get it. Hey. Thanks, everybody. Hey. <laughs> Good, I don't have to vamp this out much longer. <laughs> um, so I had to teach a couple classes on spreadsheets. Okay, great. Um, now we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna work with some data. We're gonna get it into uh, some kind of visualization software. We're gonna produce something, and then we're gonna try to make it part of a story. We're gonna put it on the web somehow. And they're like, "What's the web? Oh crap! Okay, we've got to do some basic HTML stuff here. Um, since we eliminated that class, uh, what do we do now? Okay, I gotta cram a couple classes in here, um, and." It very quickly started getting into, wait, do I do that in a spreadsheet or is that on the web? And it, it, it was a disaster, and I'm sorry. Sorry you. Well, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's the, the thing I realized was, first of all, anybody who's advertising a day, an hour, a weekend of data visualization and you know, walk away knowing it, is really uh, cheating people. Lying, yeah. And, uh, and the, you're right, it brings together so much yep. that it's probably a great one to choose because you ultimately will learn a lot. But you're right, it's, it took a while to get there. Yeah, right. and so getting around to the point, you can't learn all of this stuff. Stop trying. Stop trying right now. Pick 
something. Not only should you pick something, I would strongly encourage you to pick something that will get you to a goal that you want to get to. Now that is a bit of a difficult chore to define, but if you are really, really interested in a topic, income inequality, sports, fashion, whatever, cats, it's your thing, man, run with it, own it. And you want to do a story or you want to do a data visualization, you want to build a website, you want to do something about that thing. Pick the first least difficult and logical thing to do, to learn, to get there. And if you want to build some data-driven interactive that visualizes the uh, popularity of cat breeds since the 1850s, a, where are you getting your data? Because that's awesome. Um, <laughs> but you've never looked at a spreadsheet before? That's kind of where you need to start. You need to start with data basics. Like, go to school on just figuring out how to find some data, how to get it together, how to clean it up, how to put it in some manageable form. Don't be thinking about how, the, how you know, don't be thinking about what D3 library you're going to use. You, you, I mean, you're not even crawling at this point. Um, this is kind of the turning over moment of, of your life. Um, it is really, really easy to fall into a trap that says, I want to build, uh, build data-driven web applications. I want to use servers because servers are awesome. Let's punk. Let's punk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so not only do I need to learn a programming language, I need to learn server administration, I need to learn virtual machines, I need to learn deploying to the web, I need to learn all this stuff. Like, let's go, let's go. And you'll just end up in this tangled mess real fast. And you'll end up frustrated and you'll say, you know what, screw it, no one can ever do this thing. That's not true. I say you can't learn at all, but you can learn something. But you've got to pick it. And you've got to pick a direction and you've got to go in that direction. The Last thing I will say, and I say this to all my students, you are not allowed to quit until it works. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to quit until you see the thing you set out to build. And I say this to students, and I'll say this to you. It is phenomenally easy to get frustrated learning something new particularly something that's outside of your kind of comfort zone. If you're learning programming, if you're learning Python for the first time, it is like, uh, the way I describe to students is, it's like watching international soccer. You are watching 90 minutes of frustration. And then all of a sudden, in one brilliant second of inspiration, it works and you're <laughs> I have had students throw their hands in the air like that, jump up out of a chair. I had one student in the middle of class jump up and scream, fuck you, at his screen. <laughs> and I'm like, because it worked at that moment. <laughs> that is the best feeling ever. Seeing it work is a drug. <laughs> and if the point comes where you get that hit of that drug and you say, eh, I'm glad I did it, but it's not for me, fine, fail. You tried, it didn't work for you, there's no sense in committing your life or any more of your time to learning that thing, but you did it. If you quit before then, you can never know. You can never know if, it, if it's something that's going to work for you. But I'm here to tell you, I have very, very few students who say, eh, after it works, after it works. Now, they want to kill me before then. Uh, I can show you some emails. <laughs> little bit, well, I mean, I have a, you might tell I have a little bit of a jokey style, and I have a pretty jokey relationship with my students. So they'll send me a message saying, can I come in tomorrow and get some help with this? Yeah, sure, great, I appreciate it. P.S., I, I want you to die. 
<laughs> I'm like, yes, they're in a good spot right now. They're really learning, yes, this is awesome. Don't quit until it's done. I thought Be my emails were stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> it's the internet, dude. <laughs> so, yeah, by the way, it's really, really weird having the guy you hired in your class, or the guy who hired you in your class, because um, you really think about buyer's remorse <laughs> a lot, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> but that's pretty much it. Um, I say don't manage change. I say stop trying to figure it all out because it's impossible. No one can do it. Pick a thing and stay with it. Be stubborn until it's done. And when you and and when picking that thing, think small. The the when we talk about programmatic thinking, when we talk about algorithmic thinking, we talk about thinking like a programmer. The whole secret of it secret of it is programmers are able to take problems and blow them into a million tiny problems. And then the, the, the logical sequence then is solve one tiny problem, move on to the next tiny problem, move on to the next tiny problem, the next one, the next one, the next one, and so on and so forth. You've got to be able to do that. Because if you pull a Gary Kebble and say, I want to learn interactive data visualization with D3 and spreadsheets are really giving you fits, it's not going to go well. It's not going to go well. So. Point taken, <laughs> <laughs> and it's all true. <laughs> Lisa, I, you welcome. Know, I, I want to start out with one skill you absolutely have to learn, and that's how to read the schedule. Some people, I swear to God, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really, I, 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 I have to say, I'm really, really sorry. I hope you guys give me an opportunity, you guys on the panel too, to make it up for you. I was really <laughs> embarrassed. <laughs> um, so, but you know, I love, I love your thing about don't give up until it happens. Now the question is, is how do you manage the frustration? Learning how, learning technical, uh, doing, uh, doing a startup, which we'll talk about later, is about tolerating uncertainty. And learning these technical skills is about tolerating frustration. So how do you do it, right? You gotta make friends with the stuck, right? First of all, the first thing to realize is that people who have been in the business for 30 years get stuck every single day. Look things up every single day. Nobody actually, everybody's at, like, when you get into this technical stuff, everybody's l operating at the limits of their knowledge. So you shouldn't take from it the fact that you don't know how to do it now, that you're bad at it, or that there are some people who are naturally good at it. Those people don't exist, all right? The second thing is, is what do you do when you get stuck, right? Well, I'll tell you what I do. First of all, I don't allow myself to remain stuck for more than 20 minutes, right? That's about all I can handle before, like, I destroy some expensive equipment, and that's expensive. Right, it also like, you know, creates an environment for other people that flips them out, you know what I mean? You gotta think of like the people around you too. Right, and the second thing is, is think about, like I don't debug anything after 8 p.m. Um, I also try not to do anything super complicated with a spreadsheet or with code um, after a certain amount of time, because my, my accuracy level just goes straight down the tubes. And even my ability to like Google my ways out of it goes down the tubes. So think of a way, think of a way to sort of like, don't let yourself stay stuck for long periods of time, right? Ask first, right? If you're staying stuck for 20 minutes, like um, start writing emails. Oh, have we, have we mentioned Stack Overflow yet? <laughs> Has yet. anybody mentioned, oh my God, Stack Overflow, right? Stack Overflow, I put in a question about something incredibly obscure on this great Q&A site called Stack Overflow at like three in the morning, right? Five minutes. That's how long it somebody took me. And that, like the great thing, they rewrote my code for me. I don't know whether to be like a little weirded out or insulted by that, but it was awesome at the time. <laughs> you know. So don't let yourself stay stuck. Ask questions really early. You know, as soon as you start recognizing, <coughs> like when you're recognizing that you're stuck, look up at the clock or look at the clock on your thing, and don't let yourself stay there. Right. Try not to do things when you're tired. Right and ask questions a lot. Start developing a community of people who aren't gonna be like completely, you know, like, and, and don't worry about asking questions. This is an environment in which people ask questions of each other all <coughs> the time. So you're not bugging anybody. Anybody can push the back button on your question. Don't worry about it, okay? All right, that's it. No, Lisa, how do you pick, if you wanna learn a new skill, how do you decide which one it's gonna be? You know, um, I think Matt's other point about having a more specific goal, like um, you know, something about like like I often teach a data visualization example where we do 
um, educational attainment and uh, special education spending for kids in Rhode Island and whether that differs based on um, the sort of you know, economic level, the, the, the average household income of towns in Rhode Island, and of course it does, right? But it does in really interesting ways that are kind of surprising. So we just, that's one data set. You know, data visualization is always at least two sets of data. A map is the data plus the actual map, right? There's another set of geographic data over here that you're laying it over, right? So pick something super specific, right? Um, and don't, like, I think, like, if you say, well, I'm going to teach myself programming and try to get from there to something that will be useful in a journalism context, um, almost any programming course that you'll take will drop you off well short of that, right? The good news is, is that you don't need a four-year degree. I mean, it's great, right? But the actual, a, a lot of the actual coding skills that are useful in a journalism context are actually pretty simple. Right, like I think of the three main ones, like if you're gonna learn three skills, mapping, scraping, okay, so scraping is uh, something is on somebody's screwed up government website and all in the wrong form, and I'm going to write a little program that just takes out the bits that I want and put them in a nice place in a spreadsheet so then I can do something with them, okay. Mapping, you guys already know what that is, and what I call grabbing. So being able to grab data uh, from someone's API. If you go to, uh, there's a site called Programmable Web, which has, I don't know, several thousand APIs. So this data that's available for free, as long as you can write really very simple little programs um, to go get it, right? Um, then that gets you the data, right? Then there are all sorts of things you can do to visualize the data, right? Um, you know, so I would say in that realm, um, uh, wouldn't you say that a lot of the stuff is JavaScript on that end? Am I wrong? Yeah. Yeah, so JavaScript, yeah. And jo JavaScript. JavaScript is great because it's, it's like very highly developed. It's actually a relatively um, easy language to pick up. And then the other thing to remember is nobody writes anything from scratch anymore. Everybody's standing on the shoulders of giants. So one of the things you need to learn how to do is to browse the enormous and growing global junkyard of code, <laughs> right? So. Um, I mean, I don't write this stuff myself. Somebody on GitHub wrote it for me, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, so go over to GitHub, and it's not so much writing stuff for yourself from scratch. It's figuring out how to get something working for you, right? Like there's this um, uh, little thing that I'm obsessed with called S Story. It's available for free on GitHub. It's open source, and it allows you to make really beautiful, full screen, very tablety, scrolly presentations of stories. And it lets you embed a lot of stuff in it. And all I really had to do is, like, I didn't write that story. whole framework. I had to learn how to get my stuff to work within it, right? Which meant that I was editing a very scary looking text file, right? But when I loaded it in my browser, it looked great. So mapping, scra uh, mapping grabbing, scraping, right? Having, having an aim and understanding and being able to start to browse and take parts out of the global junkyard. And Brian, you came to this sort of uh, a roundabout way, first as a, a, as a programmer, and then, th then to journalism. So you've got a different perspective probably on what journalists should know. Sort of. I mean, yeah, I, unfortunately, I, I do have a four-year degree in computer science, and I've been a software engineer for the last 14 years professionally, and I've been coding since I was in probably second grade. Um, but I'm the exception and not the rule. Uh, the vast majority of people who do this in this business um, are journalists who learn to code, are self-taught coders, like Matt. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the weirdo in the bunch. And I got a couple things I want to throw up on screen real yeah. quick. The, um, I brought visual aids. I thought I had to. Look, this is like, if you didn't notice this, where these little thought bubbles have been emerging. <laughs> 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 but they're empty. I, I assure you. <laughs> so, I, I assure you, it is, it is for show only. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so I, 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 uh, I run the visual team at NPR. Um, um, maybe Bill. Brian. Yes, you might just oh. step to the podium when you or just tilt it towards you or something. Uh, yeah. Does that break anything? Or I could give you the microphone. Yeah. Oh. Give me back. Does that work? There we go. 
running cord. Here it is. That'll be awesome. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, All right. yeah. Hack of the mic. Um, yeah, so we build these um, big, sort of beautiful, uh, fancy websites with uh, tricky video and uh, wacky photography. Um, this is one we just launched this week, a giant visual exploration of the life at, on the borderland of Mexico. Um, we do data visualizations, we do all sorts of tricky things. And, uh, and I don't want you to teach people this stuff. Don't do it. I don't want multimedia journalists. I mean, I kind of do, right? But that, that, that's, that's the second course, the third course, right? This is actually kind of talking about what Matt was talking about. I want to talk about fundamentals, right? So this is, um, this is an example from a story we did. One of our first stories at Chicago Tribune um, was working, uh, we were researching um, the state of care at nursing homes in Illinois which in Illinois, they are places that house both the elderly and the mentally ill, um, which gets kind of messy. Um, and this website, this crappy uh, government website that is poorly designed and full of junky data, um, let's take a look at it here, has a listing of all the nursing homes in the state of Illinois. And what our reporting team, uh, actually what Sam Rowe and an intern were, were doing for months was they were going to this website, they were picking a nursing home, and they were clicking on the surveys link. And then they'd scroll down this page and they'd click this complaint investigation and they'd get a PDF and they would read it. And they would look, come on PDF, this is, let's see. Now this one's not very long, but some of these are quite long. Um, and they would read it and they would look for um, uses, they were, they were examining uh, use of psychotropic drugs, right? So drugs that you would, misuse of psychotropic drugs. So drugs you would give, say, someone for schizophrenia um, being used to uh, quiet down uh, granddad because he's a little Alzheimer's-y and ornery, right? Um, terrible, terrible things are happening, were happening, still are probably, in the state of Illinois and nursing homes. Um, and they had allocated months of time to click through this fucking website, <laughs> right? And this was like my third week on the job, and I, I'm, talk, I'm talking to the IT team, getting to know their stories, and I'm, I, I, see, I see Sam and his intern doing this. I'm like, guys, that's insane. This is what we have computers for. So I sat, you know, went back to my desk, sat down for the next four hours, and wrote a screen scraper, right? And a, um, like Lisa was talking about. And it, what, it did, what a screen, you know, screen scraper does specifically is it walks around a website like Google does. It grabs a page, it grabs a page, it clicks a link for you, it downloads the document. And in this process, you know, so four hours of coding in the afternoon, I hit go before I left work. The next morning, I've got 44,000 PDFs um, from, this nurse, from this website. And then the, the code actually sort of yanked the text out of the PDF looked for the, a dozen specific drug names, and I handed them a spreadsheet of, I think something, three or 4,000 uh, PDFs of, that they should read, right? I, mean, I hadn't actually done the reporting, but I made the reporting way, way, way faster, right? And, uh, and they were able to expand the scope of the investigation, look at the whole state before I think they were just gonna look at Cook County. It was a better piece. Um, and, uh, and, and this, this is actually a screen scraper that Mr. Bowers wrote, Jeremy's left. Um, but this, although this looks tricky, this is not hard. This is something, I mean, I, I, I've been doing this for a long time, um, and I can do this in a few hours, but I guarantee you that anyone in this room can learn to write this code in two weeks, right? This is, this is, this is, this is simple programming, right? This is not building websites. This is not fancy, super shiny shit, right? This is, Simple code that makes you a better reporter, right? And I, I, I think I've, you know, I've only been in the journalism world for for about five years now, and, but the sort of uh, the one way I've, I've tried to understand it is by breaking down the difference between reporting and presentation, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you guys know. I mean, you, a, a, a great reporter who's a bad writer just needs an editor, right? But a great writer who's not a good reporter, well, what can you do for them? I guess they can be a columnist or something, right? Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> this is, the, and, and, and writing a story is presentation. Making a data visualization is presentation. Making, making this fancy website about weird 
Mexican snacks is presentation, right? Um, but, but reporting is, is, is fundamental. Reporting does not change. Rep rep but reporting has gotten, it is, it is, it is my, much easier to do some pretty crazy reporting um, if you understand the tools. And this is what, these are the students that I want to hire, are the ones that, that know, that understand how they can use their computer to be a better journalist, right? And I can teach them to make fancy websites, right? Learning to a screen scraper, you learn one programming language. I would argue Python. Um, it is a programming language that is, until you, this, the, the, the fundamentals there, like what like Matt, Matt was talking about, the, the first five steps, right, are what I want. And because building, building fancy websites is actually really hard. You have to learn HTML, CSS, JavaScript. You probably have to, you probably have to learn how to set up a server. You have to learn to deploy code. It's, it's crazy. And you don't, you don't need to do it. I can teach that. <laughs> this is the, but this, 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 is, this, is, this is the fundamental. And some people are going to pick it up and love it and run with it. And then they'll take Journalism 375, um, how to make fancy multimedia websites. Um, but this is the one thing I feel like everyone can use every day. So. Brian, yeah. like, as Lisa gave the recommendations of scraping, grabbing, mapping, mm -hmm. you know, if, if we're trying to figure out what are, what are at least, as I say, the minimum viable skills we need to teach to the student, what, what are your recommendations? I mean, I, 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 uh, understanding how to use a spreadsheet is very important. Right? I mean, and spreadsheets are kind of, spreadsheets are this funny hack, right? Because I use spreadsheets to look at data, right? And spreadsheets are built to do balance sheets, right? They're built to do, you know, like they're, they're built to calculate figures, right? Not actually look at data, but they're a pretty good hack for looking at data. Um, uh, I, think, I think everyone should have a class in, in very simple Python. Um, specifically learning to do something like writing a screen scraper is a, is a, is a concrete small task that is solvable, right? as opposed to learning how to build multimedia websites, which is something that I, my team will continue to learn every day until we, you know, go away. Um, how do you learn that though? What's the, what do you go to do that simple So um, there are um, Google screen scraping with Python. There are tremendous tutorials. Um, Dan Wynn, of Propub formerly of ProPublica, has written a great book called the, or great online book called The Bastard's Book of Ruby, mm -hmm. where he teaches he teaches people, but teaches people how to learn Ruby, which is kind of like Python. It's another programming language, but he teaches it in the context of learning to write a screen scraper to do some journalism, um, which is a, a very nice way to learn. Um, the um, the uh, uh, learn Python the hard way is another tutorial I recommend, um, written by a guy named Zed Shah, who's kind of an asshole, so his book's got kind of an asshole name. Um, <laughs> the uh, but uh, he's a brilliant asshole. Yeah, he's a brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's um. But I mean, this, you know, it's the, there, there, are, there are many, many tutorials online for this sort of thing. But it's, it's sort of a, it's about, I, mean, what I, what I want to meet people who know how to use their computer to be more effective, right? And, and the, other, the other point I make is that this, this is, learning how to use your computer to be better at your job is something that applies if you're working in marketing. It applies if you're an accountant, right? I mean, this is, this, this is actually, this, to me, the secret sauce. The way the journalism schools can be more can continue to be relevant, right? Is this this year? This is data science, right? Um, which is like the hottest job buzzword of, of the decade, right? To be a data scientist is about understanding data and being able to communicate conclusions you've drawn from it, right? Which is what we do every day as journalists. And I mean, you know, you don't, you're not going to get a lot of. Um, I mean, data science is basically the most well-paid job you can walk into today. Right? And we could be teaching it. I mean, it is the best job. <laughs> you walk out of school, you're making six figures if you call yourself a data scientist. And journalist, journalism schools could be teaching this. Um, and some are. I mean, they're, they're, uh, Columbia is doing a pretty good job of it right now. There's a couple classes at Medill. Uh, I'm certain there are other classes that, I don't, that I'm not aware of. Um, but I mean, the, the, the four journalism, the four students who came out of the two-year master's degree at Columbia, they started doing what's a dual master's CS in journalism. Three of them walked into data science jobs. <laughs> so, um, I'd love, I'm, I'm glad one of them stayed in journalism. But anyway. Would you answer that too, but uh, yeah. grab a mic? Actually, Sorry. I just want to, I'm going to grab a mic here. I'm going to sit down. <laughs> this, this right here is a uh, fantastic example of what I was talking about, about breaking down problems into uh, really, really discrete elements. You may have never seen Python before, but once you know what you're looking at, this is 
very basic and methodical. Um, the first line, it just says, this, define a function called scrape PDF. Underneath is just really some setup stuff. I'm creating a, I'm scraping the crime index page. This is the URL of where it's coming from. The first thing you need to scrape a web page is a request. Mm -hmm. Something has to go and ask a server somewhere, please give me this page. Well, you have a variable called r uh, equals request dot gets or get URL. Go get this URL. Okay, so now we've got that. We've solved problem number one. We have a request. This is the level of tiny problems we're talking about. I now have thing. I can do thing with thing. So it says if the status code is 200, basically if the web page came back without an error, it found the page, it rendered, everything was fine, let's go ahead and grab the content and we're going to call it soup. We're going to go through that soup and we're going to find all of the links. Mm -hmm. Links equals soup.select, uh, the hash attachments is a uh, class. Uh, basically it has a class on all of the links in the page called attachments and that's where all of the PDFs live. It'll ignore everything else. We've stripped it down to just a list of links of PDFs. Okay, great. Now I have what I'm looking for. Let's go through here. For link and links, let's go through the list of links. Grab the URL. We'll split this out. We'll save it, downloading it. And if it, it actually did download at the status code of 200 on the, on the PDF, let's go ahead and save it. That's it. It's just step one, I need a request. Step two, I need links. Step three, I need to do something with those links. Step four, I need to save them. In, out, done. Um, we're talking, uh, you know, people always say all the time, I want to learn programming. I want to be a programmer. And I'm like, stop, you've already, you've already really failed. You're not going to ever, I don't think, I'm, I'm actually fairly convinced you can never learn programming. You'll never actually learn. Like, I know all of the programming. <laughs> all of it. I have learned it. I am done. It's impossible. I'd be willing to bet you that Brian here, who's been doing this for a very long time, learns something new daily. Yeah. It's the joy of the job. Yeah. That's yeah. what's fun about it. <laughs> Don't learn programming. Learn to solve a problem that you have. Have a problem first to solve it with your computer. And it's just a process of figuring out how to go about that in the, in the best way. And a lot of time that starts with going to Google and starting to look around and see what's out there. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So you found that little section of coding by searching in GitHub with keywords? Uh, you can find similar to this. Uh, this is one that Jeremy, who's not here anymore, wrote himself. Um, you can find, so this, this uses a library called Beautiful Soup. Um, which is a very apt description of a lot of HTML on the web. Um, the there's, there's about 15 different tutorials for Beautiful Soup out there uh, that are worth looking at. If you just look for a Beautiful Soup example, Beautiful Soup tutorial, you'll find one. There's actually a really good one. It's getting a little long in the tooth now, but it still works pretty great. It was actually written by uh, a developer at the LA Times named Ben Welsh. Um, he wrote a Beautiful Soup tutorial that's still on his website uh, that's fantastic. <laughs> it's a library within Python. So uh, it is a library that handles chores with HTML. Basically, it helps you parse HTML. Um, it turns each tag in an HTML document into data that you can loop through and do things with. And that's how that filtering out of links happens, is through Beautiful Soup. Beautiful Soup mm -hmm. says, Sure, you only want to select all the you want to select all the links in a page. Just look for anything with an with an anchor tag on it, and here it is, and it gives you a list of data. Okay. For uh, each of you, you each of you, um, so how long do you think it would take to get enough knowledge to be able to search GitHub for or search somewhere, search Beautiful Soup for a scraper or for a task that we want done? Find that task already there. I'll, code already written, and then just substitute out our specifics. I'm of a mind that you'll never find that. Okay. You'll absolutely never find that. You'll find 75, 80% of it. You'll find 
maybe even 95% of it sometime. Though there's always going to be a missing piece. There's always going to be somebody writing a piece of code for a specific problem, and it's in the neighborhood of yours, but it is not yours. Um, and you'll need to figure out how to hack it. Now, a lot of time that just becomes more Googling, little trial and error, seeing some other piece of code somewhere else that seems to do what you want to do, and how do I kind of merge these things together. It, it's a lot of playing around mm -hmm. and seeing how it works. Uh, how long will it take you to get there? I guess it depends on how close to that 100% you are when with the stuff that you find. Mm -hmm. um, with, with scraping, uh, I don't even really think you need to, uh, I don't think you need to go out and find somebody else's code and, and do it. Um, scraping is logical enough that if you set about trying to scrape a page uh, and it's a pretty small and, and reasonably non-complex page. So let's just say the, you have a state agency, oh say, you know, the Nebraska legislature, which puts all of its uh, transcripts for its hearings on a single page. It's just this gigantic list of mm. PDFs. Writing a scraper that will pull that page up, find all of the links in the page, and download all of them into a folder on your computer is a really easy scraper to write. You can write that one from scratch, and it's a great way to kind of step by step, I need to request the page, I need to find the links, I need to download them into a file, and okay. done. And you just kind of build from there. Okay. So. Questions? Thoughts? Yes, please. Let me get off track. So what are you using to write, the, what are you writing the scraper on? You know, to, uh, what, do you, what do you start writing? So you, um, yeah, you know Notepad? On your computer? Okay, okay. Yep. I mean, Notepad, it, Notepad, Notepad is a text editor. It's about the worst text editor, <laughs> um, but it, um, it, it, it does the job, right? Um, it's, you're, so you're not writing in, you know, the, the, the difference between a file you write in Notepad and a file you write in Microsoft Word, right? Microsoft Word's a big, ugly binary file. <coughs> it's, it's, you can't, it doesn't make any sense. A text file, this is, this is all just text files. Um, the, uh, and you can, yeah, you could write Python in Notepad. I'd recommend writing it in, uh, I don't know, what's the thing these days? What do people use? Sublime text? Or yeah, sublime use. text um, Textmate is what I use. Mm -hmm. um, but these are, you know, these are just, these are simple tools. This is the sort of beauty of programming is when you sort of understand, like what Matt was saying about sort of solving a lot of small problems. All you're, you're really doing is you're connecting simple tools to each other. You're building sort of a pipeline. You're building a flow. Um, but all the tools are actually really accessible. In contrast to building some shit in Adobe Flash, mm -hmm. right? Where the tools are thick and heavy, and you've got to plod through and drag and drop and open windows and all this junk, right? They, they, that, that those like understanding the Adobe uh, the Adobe suite is impenetrable, and I and I've been using Photoshop since I was you know, since I first pirated it when I was sixteen, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, but 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 the co coding tools are simple. They're elegant. They're, uh, they're they can be very light. Um, and, and they're just—they're all just under the surface of your computer, especially if you've got a Mac. Um, they're just—they're just behind that shiny stuff. There's a whole world of using your computer well. I'm so old. We didn't pirate it. We <coughs> stole the disks. Stole the disks. That works. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Newspaper office and on our computers. There's one thing you'll notice about what's up here that won't happen in Notepad. You notice how things are different colors? That's called syntax highlighting. And it's super useful because it shows you when things are broken. You know, if I left off, you know, I'm trying to think of something left off. That's see where it says police dot you to Oregon blah 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 crime log. See that that uh, that quote at the end. If I left that off, everything below it wouldn't work anymore, right? And with something with syntax highlighting, um, it'll show me that this rest of the stuff is the, suddenly the wrong color. You start to learn that that shouldn't be that color, mm -hmm. right? And you it gives you visual signals that things are right or wrong. Right, so you want to get a text editor with, and, and almost all of them have them. I actually just posted a link to uh, Twitter of a, like a place where you can get a list of text editors. A lot of them, a lot of the really, a lot of the best ones are free. You could download them while they're sitting here, and they're small too. Like we said, they're not big heavyweight applications, but they will help you a lot as you start. Because one of the things that's really, I got to tell you, learning anything at all about programming will make you a much more accurate typist. Yeah, <laughs> you know, um, you know, because it's so painful. Uh, if you don't get every single little, like, uh, um, code is incredibly persnickety about where you put things, like whether it's a double quote or a single quote, 
what kind of brackets you use, whether it's like a parentheses or a bracket, all of that kind of stuff. And syntax highlighting kind of gives you the gentle nudge that says, oh, that's not, that's not right. It's not right. Fix that. By the way, that's the only gentle nudge you'll get. In <laughs> Pretty just, much. I've described programming as like being in an abusive relationship. <laughs> <laughs> if you do everything right and you didn't tell it to tell you anything and you run something, nothing will happen. Absolutely <laughs> nothing will happen if you have done it right. It will only yell at you if you have done it wrong. And that's just the definition of an abusive relationship to me. <laughs> it's, it's the most anti-millennial thing ever. It's, there is no gold star for getting it right. There's, it's just nothing happens on the screen. And I have to tell students, you will type this, you'll hit enter, and nothing will happen. Relax. If nothing happens, you've done it right. And they're weirded out by that. Um, I would warn you, uh, you can get lost into a very dark hole uh, looking for a text editor. Don't fret about whether or not you have the right one. Don't fret about whether or not you're using the one that everybody else is using. It's, it's the old saw about the best camera is the one you have with you. The best spreadsheet is the one that you use. It's, it's the same thing. If you use Notepad, great, man. Actually, go look for Notepad++, which is an upgraded version of Notepad that does syntax mm -hmm. highlighting um, for my Windows people. Um, TextMate's great, but it's one of a hundred of them. Whatever one you choose, whatever one works for you, whichever one talks to you in some way and, and you're comfortable with, use that one and don't worry about it after that. Yeah, if you're gonna have like two tools, I say you have to have a text editor, right? And then the other thing is, let's say this is not this is not actually code to represent something in a web browser, right? It's code that's uh, meant to go look at a web page and go grab things and put them in a file or a folder, right? But let's say that it was code that was, uh, when we loaded in a web browser, would show something visual to you, right? Um, a lot of times when you get one of those things wrong, what shows in your browser is nothing, absolutely nothing. You get a blank page. And so you get very little feedback. Like, so you'll, you'll be starting out and you'll be like, well, what did I do wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So are you gonna show it? You're gonna show the, uh, show it, please show. What, what was I gonna show? Are you gonna, are you gonna show the, gonna the show? little, uh, the console that's, oh. that's uh, built into Chrome, the, the oh, little no. JavaScript console? I love it. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's a JavaScript console that's built into a lot of browsers where uh, I think it, I think on a Mac it's uh, Command J. I don't know if I'm right about yeah, that. Yeah. There it is, right? If something's wrong, it shows you here, right? And in particular, it'll show you the line number, mm -hmm. the line number that you'll be able to see in your text editor. It says this is an error on line 161, right? That's critical. Very often, though, it's it, okay. it can be wrong. Um, but it can't be an error after that line. Very, like, very frequently I find it's actually the line before that sometimes. But it'll show you where things are gone, uh, are. And while, while he's doing that, I, I just want to check on other questions. And yes, please. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, and I have to say, you know, like when I got started in the media industry, um, I could not get arrested for giving lectures. Mm -hmm. I worked in a very male-dominated industry, and what I, what, I, what I think now, looking back, is that maybe, peop maybe the, the men who could have mentored me didn't like the optics of a 20-year-old girl hanging around. So if you can mentor, please do, because people tend to mentor people who look like themselves, look like younger versions of themselves. And so um, if you're unusual in your environment, please mentor. I mentor a lot of women. Um, I think it's super useful to have that. I also think that um, things like code, uh, you guys know about um, uh, Code With Me. You know, there are a lot of events now, events are becoming popular where somebody is literally, this is the weirdest event ever, you're gonna think I'm insane, but um, people will code and there'll be code up on the screen and then you'll do it on your website. It's like an incredibly quiet room of people watching code as if it was a movie, <laughs> right? It's bizarre, but it's great, Some weird you know what I mean? You know, so yeah, absolutely, find people who you can get with. The, great, the way that I find people like that is through meetup.com. How many people live in a relatively urban area in this room? 
Oh wow, so okay, that's rough, you know, because like I like that works for me because I'm in an urban area. There are about a million different technical mm -hmm. meetups where I can go meet people, find people who know something, you know, find places where people are gonna give talks a lot like this one about how they did something. Right? Um, if you're if you're not, I think it's a little bit harder. I'd be interested in hearing like like how did you find your mentors? How did you find them? Me? Yeah, how did you find yours? Or okay. have you not found them yet? Uh, So that's how I found my mentors, but not everyone has the ability to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, you, you mentioned pair programming. Um, I'd like to talk about this for a second. So there's this myth, um, I, probably created by the nerds, that, that, that programming is this sort of wizardy thing, that you have these sort of magic skills, and you sort of go into your den with the lights off and make software, and then come out and reveal it. And um, and it's 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 this it's this solitary world, and that's bullshit. I mean, there are some programmers like that, and I call them antisocial. Uh, <laughs> the the I, I am I'm on our team quite frequently, not all the time, um, but as often as often as possible, are pair programming, which means two people sitting at one keyboard. So it's like specific, like instruction tip, right? right? Don't make everyone do it on their own. I am a better programmer when I'm sitting next to another programmer. Um, two people, and, and, and from a practical perspective, from like a, you know, a staffing perspective, I truly believe that two programmers <coughs> at one keyboard are more productive than two programmers at two keyboards. Because um, you're learning, you're bouncing ideas off of each other, you're fixing each other's mistakes, you're moving faster, and you're having, and you're having a conversation. You're, you're, you're talking through your ideas before you start typing. Um, it is a great way to learn both, I mean, a novice learning with an expert, Two experts, two novices, it all works. Um, you know, it's, it's not just, I mean, it can be mentorship or it can just be getting from zero to go. Um, and if I was gonna rant about one of it, if you're gonna take home two more ideas, you also said software craftsmanship. Um, you can Google that, there, there, are, um, there are courses you can take, academics are really into this stuff, about um, specifically the act of, the, the craft of making software, um, which is a good sort of level up, level two thing to do. And if I was going to throw one more tool out there while we're being really um, pragmatic, this is, I don't know if you can see this, this is a, a tutorial for a thing called CSV Kit that my teammate Chris Groskopf wrote. Um, that just, just the two, it's a great tool to learn for how to manipulate data without getting really deep into databases. Um, but his tutorial, his sort of getting started, is a great way to learn how to use the command line on your computer, mm -hmm. which is step zero, mm -hmm. um, is learn how to use the command line. We're not using windowed tools with mouses and boxes and pointers. Um, you have to learn how to use the command prompt. And the CSV kit tutorial is a great sort of way to start, um, even if you don't want to use CSV kit. We have probably a minute or, uh, right. to go. And uh, for, so I want to see if there's any, any final question or comment. If yes. Uh, a question. Uh, it's kind of specific related to the scraping and grabbing and all of this stuff. And currently, you need to be able to write this in order to use it. How long before you simply go to some sort of website and say, this is what I want to do, and it does it for you? It's the Ahabian goal of the internet. There's been about 15 different attempts at that, and all of them end up falling apart at some point. And it's because of the absolutely limitless ways that human beings have come up with to fuck up HTML. And <laughs> At some point, a computer's just like, I cannot anticipate all of the different ways that you have screwed this up. I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> On the flip side, though, I mean, there are tools. I completely agree. Um, but there are tools like If This Then That, IFTT, yeah. yeah. which is a delightful little website that helps you sort of turn a little bit of information on the web into a little other little bits of information on the web that sort of act as a pipeline. Um, I mean, Scraper Wiki. Scraper Wiki yeah. is a pretty good tool. I mean, but the. The thing is that you, you still, if you really want to work, you need, to, you need to learn how to use your computer. And um, 
I mean, the, but but that said, it has gotten so much easier to be to be a programmer just in the in the span of my career. Like when I started, I, I had to read books on programming. Like I had to read book. I had to look up what I wanted to do in the index. Right. I, I would go to Barnes and Noble and stand in the programming section and read the indices of books. Right. And now I can Google for it and get an answer in a second, or, or less than a second. It's pretty cool. These t this has gotten so much easier to do. And and and, and I was talking to someone outside, outside of this earlier. I mean, what, what's wonderful about is each year a new problem gets abstracted away. So I can stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can solve a harder problem. And the hardest problem of all is not programming, but what our audience needs. Is what, what does our user need? What is the design of this thing? How should it work for them? Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, programming is, is every day becomes more plumbing. And all I right. think that uh, Lisa, Brian, and Matt can stick around for anybody who has some questions after this. We hope that you got a couple messages around the idea of uh, start simple, pick one thing, have a strategy, pursue it, and there are indeed lots of tools out there. Don't reinvent things. Learn the, to the tools best to learn are the ones in which uh, a lot of information has already been compiled for you, and these people can give you those resources. And I see that several people have been tweeting about this, and I think a list of tools are probably going to be in the tweets from this section, so I think that will be very helpful also. So thank you all very much.